We want to welcome you all tonight as we get into our weekly Bible study. We've been studying the I am's of God. And there are seven plus, and we've picked out seven I am's. Last week we studied I am the bread of life. Tonight we're going to study I am the light of the world. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, what a great honor, what a joy to come and to stand in your presence that we know we can do that because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. The Holy Spirit, we're glad that you dwell in us tonight to give us the purpose and the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ that we might carry out his fullness and all that he's asking us to do. I ask you to bless this word tonight. As simple as it might seem, I pray that it might give understanding, insight, and release to those that we are talking to and wherever this video will go. We thank you for this night and we give you glory in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. We're going to go to John chapter 8, verse 12, and it says this. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to light. As we come to the second teaching in the I am, Jesus comes along and he begins to talk uh, in what he's saying. And he just says, I am, I'm the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the light of the world. And it really upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, because they understood the Old Testament, not having the New Testament yet. They understand the old. And when Jesus said, I am, they're saying, are you equating yourself to be equal to God? And he is equal to God and he is God. And it really upset them that he would take that kind of a stance. And when Moses asked, Jehovah God said, when you send me back to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, they won't listen to me. Who do I say sent me? And he said, I am. All inclusive. Abraham only had the name and the knowledge of Jehovah, character and uh, the character of God. When Moses comes along, he gets an in-depth insight of who jehovah god is and god has revealed himself and down through the ages he's done more and more revealing and even as we close out the church age he becomes more revelatory to your life and to my life and and there are seven uh times jesus said i am and all of them he does that to uh partner or position himself in front of the people for his mission and his message and his ministry. And when he says, I am, he is saying before the people uh, that I am equal to God and I am God incarnate. I am Emmanuel, God with you. And they would not receive that because of their unbelief and because they're coming out of 400 ages, years of dark age. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But today he's saying, I am the light of the world. The bread had to come first in order for the people to be uh, saved and the bread of salvation and the the feeding of the hungry soul and the lost spirit. And now we begin to walk out the ministry and the mission of, of God, restoring man back to the father as it was purposed in the Garden of Eden. Now, listen to what I'm about to say. When Jesus came, he came for uh, he came for the desire to position people back in a place where they could begin to walk with God as Adam and Eve did in the Old Testament. And it was there that restoring man back to the Father as it was purposed in the garden. But when Adam and Eve sinned, what they did is they gave up the right to walk with God They gave up the glory and they traded in all of mankind for sin. And in that sin, the door of death was opened. And it was uh, was when we walk through the door of death or we walk through the rapture of the church 
we're going to see a total restoration that God has for us. Somebody has a noise in the background. If you'll mute, mute yourself, that would be a whole lot better. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And so uh, Jesus is the restorer. He is bringing the, that which is lost and which has been unattained or unattended to. Now listen to what it means to restore. It means to, uh, to restore is being, bring back to its original state, back to its original beauty. And when Jesus comes into humanity, he's coming to a people that have been lost, have been, un, have been un, um, unattended to, and they've lost their beauty. They've lost their value. And he's walking among people that are dead and they need to be restored. They need to be put back into the right position and image that God intended man to be when he started him out in the Garden of Eden. And so Jesus is now beginning to restore man, and it will not stop until we either die or go through the rapture of church. But once we stand in the presence of the Lord, we will be totally restored back to the original state that God had in mind for your life and for my life. And it'd be a place when he reinstates us, when we stand in heaven, there'll be no more broken hearts. There'll be no more bodies that won't work with all kinds of diseases and birth defects. We'll be in a place where we won't, the un, underprivileged will no longer be underprivileged. We'll be in a place where the persecuted no longer will be pure persecuted. There will be in a place where there will be no more hunger, spirit, soul, or spiritual bodies. We'll be in a place of no more, no mores. There won't be any lack. We'll be complete, completely restored to a place where when Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden, they lacked nothing. They had everything. And that's exactly what God, Jesus, is trying to do and tried to do when he walked the earth. And then when he left, he said, I'm sending away the, com I'm, I'm going away and I'm sending back the comforter and he's going to lead and guide you into all truths. And he is going to help restore you and I'm going to live in you. You see, when Jesus was on the earth, he could only be at one place at one time doing one thing. But when he went away, he said, now I can be everywhere at the same time doing the same thing. And when you are filled full of the Holy Spirit and you go out into the marketplace this week and you walk into a broken life or a, a, a destroyed person or a person that is facing divorce or walking around having a, uh, a, a statement over their lives that they've got cancer not very long to live and you being full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I am going with you so that I can replicate myself and I'm going to do what I did when I was walking the earth. I want to now do it through you. And so wherever you go, you are my wheels, if I could say it that way. And wherever you go, I want to work through you, through the fullness of the Holy Spirit, touching those which are broken so that they might be restored, be saved, and be brought to the family of God. And that's exactly what he's calling you and I to do when he says, I am the light of the world, and we're going to find out what it means. There's three things that I want to explain to us, and I've never been real good at having snappy statements. I'm real simple in my one, two, and three marks, and so here they are. Number one, why did he choose to say, I am the light of the world? It has to do with darkness. Number two, what does the light do? And number three, what does the light look like in the last days? Here we go. Why did he choose to say, I am the light of the world? Jesus came to redeem us. He came to restore us. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they transferred mankind from glory, the light, to Lucifer and darkness. And darkness began to cover man. And when darkness comes on anything, it first brings, number one, chaos. And one of the signs of, if you have chaos in your life, it is a sign that there's a form of darkness or an area of darkness in your life that God is trying to expose through the power of the Holy Spirit 
to get rid of that because darkness has to deal with chaos on the inside. I'm not talking about the chaos that's out here. We're in the world and in the world we will have tribulation. But in here, we will have a peace that passes understanding that will keep us and guard us, that will overflow over our lives. And though the pressure of the world is trying to press its ideology and its philosophy on us, trying to make us look like I, um, the world and talk like the world and act like the world, the, the pressure of the Holy Spirit will push that out and we will begin to live a life of freedom in the midst of a chaos, corrupt world. Can I get a witness from somebody on that? And secondly, darkness brings death or a stunted growth. And uh, Jerry Alice, you need to mute your speaker, please. Okay, there you go. All right, and darkness, or stunted, stunts our growth. Darkness also, things that become, when we have darkness, we become unproductive. If you have dark forest and the, the forest is very thick at the top, you'll find out on the forest floor that it's not very green, but it's full of moss and slime because nothing can grow in the midst of, of having no sunlight. And so darkness stunts our productiveness. And darkness always obscures the sun, and it always results in judgment. I want you to look at the people from Adam to Noah. It was so bad with mankind that only seven righteous people at the end of those six chapters, their blood was not tainted and spoiled. And they're the only seven out of the whole of creation that lived because they got on the ark and they were saved and and uh, got on the Noah's boat and they were saved and God had to destroy the world. Look at Genesis chapter six and five through seven, what God says. Okay, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. God was sad that he made man and put him on the earth and broke his heart. From Genesis 1 to Genesis, Genesis 6, just six chapters out of the whole of the Bible, man goes from walking in the garden to utterly being destroyed because darkness was given over to them and that's how corrupt they were. And then we go down through the history of time from Noah and we get to Malachi. And the Bible says in Malachi that it teaches through historians that there was 400 years of darkness between Malachi and Matthew. Nothing was spoken of God. Nothing was written. Nothing was uh, sought after in that. And we come to a place uh, in, Malachi, in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, and God begins to break the silence, and he says this, just before Jesus is born. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord's returning. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Okay. In Matthew, it's the beginning of the end. Malachi prophesies, prophesies this and Luke says the same thing. And he says that he's sending a prophet, which was John the Baptist. And he said he's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. That he's going to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. And Jesus comes, John the Baptist comes, then Jesus is born, Jesus is resurrected, and the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. And the Holy Spirit, from the time of Jesus or John the Baptist until 
the end of what we know in Revelation chapter 22. The work of the Holy Spirit is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord, to restore them so that they can stand in the presence of God, restore them so that they are worthy to stand in the courtyard of God, restore them through salvation and through the filling of the Holy Spirit so that they can be a people uh, walking upright for God. And for the last 2,000 years, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a preparing a people to meet the Lord. And people have died and they're prepared to meet him through salvation. And we're living in this time that if <clears throat> not very much days hence, we're going to see the people, we're going to be the people that are going to go through the rapture of the church. I don't know if it's this year or next year or the next five years. I pray that it's soon. But you look around the world and it's getting corrupt and darker by the day. And we are the light that shines in this. And our responsibility and our commitment of God is not only that we're prepared to meet the Lord, but the light that shines in us. We must now go and live in this darkened world. And we have the message of hope. We have the message of salvation. And we are endowed by the Holy Spirit. And we are the resident life of Jesus that he died on the cross for the purpose of saving people. And our job, mainly more than anything else, is to witness so that people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's only two things that are gonna pass from this life into the next. One is the word of God and the other is souls. Everything else will be burned up. The only thing that's of value is the soul of a person. They're either going to go live in the presence of Jesus Christ or they're going to go live in the lake of fire for forever. And so God is calling us to prepare families, generation after generation, teaching the word of the Lord to the next generation to be ready to meet the Lord. Secondly, what does the light do? It repels the darkness. Listen to John in 1, 1, John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the Praise beginning God. with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, did you say one through four. Okay, that's it. Jesus is, and let me say it this way, he is the life light. He said, I, he comes to light up men's lives, to turn on the life in our lives. It's life to all mankind. The light is the life. It's what causes all of nature to grow. It is the life of Jesus to and for the believer. The unbeliever walks in darkness ruled by the demonic, filled with chaos and death and unproductive, just existing, going through the motions, seeking money and power and authority and domination. And when they get it and receive it, and they're at the pinnacle of wealth or authority or domination, it's just as empty there as when they started seeking its climb to become that person. But the believer, the life light of Jesus comes into the spirit of man and moves him and her from death to life, to live, to be productive, fulfilled, and the chaos is stopped, no longer going to be one problem after another. Aren't you glad that you can live a life days on end, if not weeks on end, if not months on end or years on end, in a sense of peace? on the inside and not troubled. And when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, you go to sleep and you rest and you can turn off the world and all that it says. And you can begin to know that they are not your keeper. They don't take care of you. They don't provide for you. There is one who sits at the right hand of the father. His name is Jesus. He has given you and I the Holy Spirit to live within us and to bring a peace that passes understanding to guard our hearts and our minds. And we live in a sane world. 
instead of an unseen world. It's no longer those problems. In verse five, it says, and the darkness could not push back the light, but had to flee. The enemy loves to move in darkness. And if he can, he'll keep people blinded to the truth of Jesus and the light he will can lead them to do as he wishes. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, what it says. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. Okay. The conscience is clear means it's light. It's true. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. What does 1 Corinthians 4 and 3 and 4 say? That was first. You got first on here. Sean. Oh, second. try second. I'm sorry. Now you want 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 4. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who yeah. don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Satan blinds the minds of the people. And the Bible says in the last days which we're living in, they call evil good and good evil. And you just listen to the hypocrisy of people. And you want to stop and say, are you listening to what you're saying? It is so counterproductive, counter, it's so against anything that is truth and right. But they believe the lie over anything that's truthful because their minds have been blinded. But when Jesus Christ comes into the life of a person, he takes the blinders off. And for the first time, they can see. Listen to Psalms 119, 130. Okay, the teaching of your word gives light, so even the simple can understand it. The teaching of the word of God gives light, and even the simple can understand it, meaning this, that God says that when you begin to teach the word of God, listen to the word of God, hear the word of God, it will begin to push out the darkness of our lives. That's why it's important that every day you are in the word, studying and reading it, more than just Read your one scripture or your one chapter a day. You need to begin to read it with, I don't care if you read just one verse or one chapter. But when you get done, you need to have grabbed a hold of what you read so that you can chew on it all day long so that word can begin to permeate into your spirit and it can begin to wash out anything and everything that doesn't look like Jesus. There's people who read the Bible, and they get up and walk away and say, what'd you read? Oh, I just read a chapter. What did it say? I don't remember. Well, you're wasting your time, God's time, and everything that's going on. We need to sit down, open up the Word of God, and take time every day to, to more than just read it, but begin to study it, because it will bring light to our lives. You'll walk in the light, and you won't stumble. The reason that people stumble, the reason that they don't know what to do next. The reason they don't know how to make decisions. The light's not turned on. They're walking in darkness. And so the eye of a blind person is blinded and they can't see. The entrance of your words are light. In order for Satan to deceive mankind, he transforms himself into an angel of light. Listen to 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. But I am not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Yeah. You know, when Job, when it talks about Job, the Bible says that Lucifer stood with all of the angels. They didn't even recognize he was <coughs> standing there. God picks him out and said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, he said, what about Job? And they have a discussion, and you know the story about Job, what he went through. But he stands there as an angel of light, and this is what he does. He comes as an angel of light in the world today, and he begins to preach his gospel through false prophets and false preachers and ideology, and he gets people to follow him because he preaches a gospel that has no sacrifice and no suffering, 
no denial of self. It only appeals to the ego. If you're sitting in a church somewhere and all they're teaching you is how to be a better you, and it appeals to your ego and how much better you are as opposed to who Jesus really is. If the message is not centered on Jesus and the cross, you need to get up and get out of that place because you are sitting under someone who is disguised as a man or a woman of God that has laced their message with a watered down, I feel good, you feel good ministry. That's why the Methodists are now letting transgenders in their pulpits and gays in their pulpits. Other pastors are standing up that are not even Methodists and saying, we need to believe in or be gracious to the homosexual. I believe in the person. I don't believe in the sin. And they make allowances for <clears throat> the sins of people instead of saying, Jesus loves you, but you've got to repent of your sins. The woman caught in adultery, Jesus loved her and he forgave her. And he, the last thing he said to her is, go and don't sin no more. That's the message of the cross. That's the light of the gospel that comes inside of you and I, that dispels between the, the angel of light, Lucifer, and the true light, which is Jesus Christ. And it begins to reveal the falseness. And there are shades of gray, there are shades of darkness, there are shadows that is in Christendom today that should never be. It's either got to be white or black, and that's it. There's no middle ground. Love is kind and merciful, but it has a boundary. It will only go so far, and it will only allow so much. And so the, any gospel that promotes a, a ministry to self and not to the spirit life is an angel dressed in light, not the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that light is the glory of God that shrouds you and I, that covers you and I right now. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, you know why they never saw their nakedness? Because all they saw was the reflection of God's glory. And the moment that they sinned, the veil of glory lifted and their shameful self stood there. And they saw their nakedness. People who die right now from the time of Adam and Eve, now the rapture of the church, when we get a new, they come back and get their body and get a new body, they do not have a body like we have. They have their spirit and soul there, so they are shrouded with the glory of God that encapsulates them. And when we get our new bodies and we stand there, it will be a shroud of glory around that body. We will shine as he shines. And what happens with people today when they struggle with their sins and their past and their failures and they can't get over them, you know what, they, and they're saved, you know what they do? They go in and they lift up the robe of righteousness or they lift up the glory and they look underneath and they see the dirt and the failure and the grime. And they begin to look at things that the blood has already covered. I'm telling you that when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he forgives you and he covers your past. He covers your embarrassment. He covers your failures. And we are not to bring them up anymore. Jesus is the only one that can forgive and forget. He wipes it from his mind that you ever were sinful. He sees the glory of himself on you, and he relates to that glory and that reflection of himself. And that's what he loves about you and I, because we are filled to fullness with the Holy Spirit. And so the blood of Jesus covers us. And I'm telling you tonight, quit picking up the glory that's on you and looking underneath what has been covered by the blood of Jesus. What has been forgiven, let it go. Whatever is in the past, get over it and let it be, go be gone. That's the pitfall. And the light is truth. And light reveals and exposes things in us. That's why the more we walk with the Lord and the light shines in us, it begins to go into the cracks and the crevices of our lives 
things that are behind curtains, things that are behind closed doors, shadows inside of our lives, and he shines his light on it because not to harm us, not to make us feel bad, but he said, this is a place where the enemy of your soul has a right to live and has a right to work his authority inside of you against you. But I am the light, and then when I shine inside of you, it'll push that out, and there will be no shadow, there will be no darkness, you'll be full of light, and with that will be the life of God, and you will have joy unspeakable, and you'll be full of glory. In John, 1 John 1, 7, it says this. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, and we have fellowship with him, with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. As we walk with Jesus, we walk in the light and we're cleansed. It is a process that God is moving deeper and deeper into our spirit, into our psyche, into our thought process in order to shine the light of God. Transform our thinking, transform our attitudes, transform our behaviors, begin to speak expose pitfalls in our lives that cause us to stumble and say i'm going to show you where the darkness is there and i want to change that because of your childhood raising or because of what happened in your past life or our commitments you, you've made to yourself it's like a person that goes through a divorce and they say things like this i will never ever fully trust someone like that ever again and then they wonder why they have struggles in their marriage is because there is a place where they get to and they said i don't go any further than this and we make commitments and judgments to ourselves that are behind closed doors filled with darkness gives the enemy opportunity to keep us from walking in the life and the love and the liberty that the lord has for us and we, the light shines on that and said, I want you to break that judgment. I want you to break that commitment. I want you to break what you said. And I want you now to learn to love again or to hope again or to live again. Satan loves to keep things hidden. And many people have hidden things in their lives, which gives Satan the foothold of power in our lives. And you want to know how to stop somebody from blackmailing you, how the enemy blackmails you, like saying, don't forget what you did five years ago. You know how to get rid of a blackmailer? You expose the hidden thing. And when you do, there's nothing they can blackmail you over. Now, you don't go and expose it to someone else. The Bible says, bear one another's burden to each other. Burdens, yes. Confess our sins, yes, but no person has the ability to heal me except Jesus. And go to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is what I have that I'm being blackmailed by the enemy and I've never confessed it. I've never told it to anybody. I promised that I would always keep it a secret to myself until the day I die. And I'm telling you, Jesus is coming to you right now. And he's saying to you, I want you to confess this to me. That that you keep hidden, that that you're afraid that is going to get out, that that you are afraid somebody's going to know about you and not like you. And I want to take just a moment and I want to stop right where we're at and loud enough for you to hear. And the reason I'm saying that is so Jesus can hear but the enemy can't read your thoughts. And I want you to take just a moment. And if there's some things that you need to confess, I want you to say it under the whisper of your breath, but I want you to say, I'm exposing this to you right now. now I'm just gonna take a minute, I'm gonna stop. And I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit move on you in just a second. And if there's something you need to confess, Something you need to get out. You need to do it right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your conviction. We confess that right now. We give that to you. 
we break the power of the blackmailer over our life. We want your light to shine in Jesus' name. Amen. What does darkness do? It blinds, it hides the truth, it causes death. And Satan has power over the darkness. Can I prove that? Absolutely. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 53. Jesus is about to go to the cross and look what he says. Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. This is the time when the power of darkness reigns. What Jesus was saying, I am going to allow the power of darkness that's in the outer side or outside of me to take control and send me to the cross. But I want you to know that on the inside, he has no control. How do I know that? Listen to John chapter 14, verse 30. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's get going. What he's saying is Satan has no dirt in me. He has no darkness in me. He has no power over me on the inside. I can't control what goes on out here, but I'm telling you right now, that out here is not going to control this on the inside. And when Jesus comes to restore you and I, his goal is so that there is nothing on the inside that gives power to the enemy to rule you and I. If the government wanted to come down hard on me, and accuse me and throw me in jail, there probably is nothing I know I could do about it. But I'm telling you, they're not going to get a hold of my soul and they're not going to get a hold of my spirit. And they're not going to move me to become like them no matter what they do. That's what Jesus is saying. My, I'm telling you, Satan is coming, but he will find nothing in me. And the Bible says that when he shall appear, we shall look like him meaning that Jesus is in the restorative business with being the light in the world, coming to restore you and I back to our perfect self, that we walk in the light as he is in the light, and we will not stumble, we will not fail, and we will not fall. That's exactly what Christ is wanting to do in you and I, so that we're filled with the light and no darkness is in us. And so Satan can't lay claim to you in any way. And God wants to make sure that nothing is hidden. As you, we get done with this teaching tonight, I'm almost done. But when we get done, I've been praying that throughout this next week, you're going to go along. And there's things that are going to pop up inside of you. It's going to be the Holy Spirit and said, this is darkness. I want, I, want to, I want light to shine on this. This you need to confess. This you need to turn over this you need to let go and quit blaming it happened it's over but i'm telling you i can't bring you to healing i can't heal your heart i can't restore your future i can't make you new until you're willing to let go of what others have done to you let it go it's over and done you see when you don't forgive someone you put them in jail and guess who the jailer is you you have to sit there to make sure they're in jail and the two of you relive this together. And the funny part is they don't even know you're reliving it because they're not. So you need to let it go. To be like Christ and to have no shadows in our lives. Look at James chapter 1 verse 17. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. There's no shadows in God. There's no place for fault. There's no place for things to be hidden. He is completely brilliant and bright. And the eternal plan is that we become total light. No place of falseness, not a lie in us, not a fault in us only true perfection. And when we stand in glory and we look at people that we may have known on this earth that have done wrong, but have asked for forgiveness are standing there. 
We won't see that. All we'll see is the perfection, the healing, and the glory of God. And Jesus wants you and I to look at believers with that same thing. What Jesus has forgiven, we forgive. What he has released blessing to, we bless. We follow what Jesus is doing. We don't set a standard. We don't walk in judgment. We walk in the favor of God, blessing one another because of the glory and that is there and the light that is on them. Number three, what does light do? It gives us covering. Number two, it reveals the truth and exposes the sin. And number three, it makes sure there's no shadow in our lives. Lastly, it's the reflection of God. The moon is a dark place, always. The only reason that it has light is because it's a reflection of the sun. The moon does not have a light in it. It is a reflection of the sun. And you and I, when we were dead in our trespasses, there was no light in us. But when the sun shined upon us, we became the reflection of God. Walk away from God and you're not going to have any light in you. But when you stand in his presence, you become the reflection, the brilliance, the glory of God that's in you. You and I were dead and dark in our sins. And when Jesus came, we begin to glow like never before because we're a reflection of him. We must keep the light bright in us. And the way that we do that is by meeting the terms of the gospel. And they are 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 through 10. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So... Be truly glad there is a wonderful joy ahead. And even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, expressionable joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. The salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. Amen. First John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Amen. First John chapter two. Mm -hmm. How many verses? Fifteen through seventeen. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Yes. And, when go on, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will never live. Well, pleases God will live forever. Amen. Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 26. This is the terms of the gospel. Galatians 5, 5, 16 through 26. I didn't put it down. I'm sorry. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, and you won't be doing what your sinful nation craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, yeah. impurity, lustful yeah. pleasures, 
idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. When we live a different life, we don't inherit. As the light reflects in the world, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. I'm almost done. Two more scriptures. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Listen to me. Don't cancel out. Don't conceal your talents, your ability, your calling of God. You are called of God. Christ lives in you. He wants to be everywhere at the same time. He's taking you into the marketplace and you're going to run into people who are going through a divorce, who have the term of cancer on them, they're not gonna live very long, who have children that are wayward and gone, don't know what to do, they're in chaos. And Jesus wants to answer their lives. He wants to touch them where they're at. And the only way he can do that is through you. And that's why you're a light, not set under a bushel, but you're set on a pole. Don't be afraid to shine. Don't be afraid to speak the truth of God. Be open about who he is and share that because it is not your words. It's his words moving through you that dispels the darkness and pulls the blinders off their eyes and they come to know Jesus and get saved. Lastly, the last days, what eternity in the new Jerusalem the city is going to be like. Revelations chapter 21, 22, and 23. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. Okay, 22. There's not going to be a, a moon or a sun in the New Jerusalem. It's going to be the glory of God, and we're going to be like mirrors reflecting that. Here it is, last one. No longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. No curse will be there. There's no shadow in God. If I took this bottle and filled it up with rocks and then poured water in it. Every rock would be wet on its surface all the way around. It's the same thing that when we stand in heaven and there may be, I don't know if there's gonna be curtains. I don't know if there's gonna be walls. I know he's building a city. I, I don't know what is gonna be there that can cast a shadow. But it would be as if right now, this phone has light on it, but not this side. When the glory of God is in the new Jerusalem, it will shine on both sides underneath and over. There will not be a place where darkness can prevail. There won't be a place where evil can ever come in. There won't be a place where sickness can ever come. There won't be a place where Lucifer can demand a place to stand and give his power because the light has literally dispelled and thrown that out into the lake of fire. And the glory of God wants to come into your life and my life and fill us to fullness tonight so that we don't deal in harm, heartache, pain, lack of joy, lack of completeness. I'm telling you, 
The Holy Spirit is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. And he's working in your life and my life to be the light in your world, to fill you to fullness. And we must not wait for that day when we stand in the new Jerusalem to walk in complete light. We must start in that trail of progress, allowing that light to shine in us, into the dark spots, into the shadow, into the gray spots, into the things that we don't think are very significant, but are not given over to the Lord. There must be a place where that light shines in us. And that's what Jesus is wanting to do when he said, I am the light of the world. He is brokenhearted when any one of his children are taunted and threatened by the enemy. When they take a step back instead of a step forward. We need, having done all, to stand. And God wants us. And in the days ahead where we're going into these dark days that are going to progressively get darker, we need to make sure that our light gets brighter. No matter what, that we don't stand down or stand back because somebody says that our message is not accepted in this generation. Because when you turn the light on, people had no idea that they could walk in a different lifestyle. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you that you are the light of the world. And I ask you to fill all of our lives and our homes and our children and our grandchildren with the light of life. That we walk in the light as you are in the light. And we won't stumble. But Father, we will grow more and more to that bright day coming. And that when you shall appear, we will be like you. Fill us tonight. With that, expose any darkness, any shadows in us. And God, cause us to be people that let our light so shine in this world that the darkness flees and Jesus takes ground. We thank you for it in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Any prayer requests? Anybody want something you want to share that God spoke to you tonight or something else in your teaching? Okay. We want to pray for Danny tonight, uh, Shirley's husband. He's got a um, irregular heartbeat, and we want to pray that God will bring it to be regular. Judy has a friend named Julie that um, had breast cancer, and they thought they got it all, and now she has a different kind of cancer that's very, very rare. And it's in her blood and in her bone. And uh, they had one girl in the church who was 38, her church, that had the same thing. And the believers began to pray. And the doctor said, all I can tell you is I can't find it. And the only thing I can tell you, it's a miracle because you're free. And Julie is believing that God is going to completely heal her. And we need to pray for Julie Lowe. Uh, we need to pray for her. Uh, we need to pray for, who was that? Was there one other? Oh, um, Nathan. Oh, Nathan's got a big Nathan's case. got a huge case, and he's asking the Lord to give them favor in a lawsuit that uh, they need to win because uh, they are on the right side of this one. Not just because he's a lawyer, but they are on the right side. And um, pray for Judy, my Judy's uh, back, bulging back, that God will completely heal and restore that. We've just been inundated this week with uh, people that are in need of great prayer. So we just need to lift that up and go from there. Our uh, youngest Seth uh, is in a new job. And the last position he transferred within the company, but the last position, the lady didn't like him and he got passed over three times. So he got in this new position and they wanted to know where he's been all their life. And the president of the company, which is United Healthcare, uh, has already told him that it looks like they're going to put him over a whole division. 
and he's only been there less than a year and it's probably going to almost triple his salary and God is bringing favor and he called us tonight and Jude's talking to Judy and he said I don't know what that holds I'm a little nervous and Judy said God has plans because what happened is father-in-law was a fireman and around 25 to 30 he fell through a three-story building and he's been on crippled almost all his life and the mom the wife just can't do it anymore she can't pick him up when he falls and they have three other children and they wanted to put the dad in the rest home and Seth said not happening so Seth has moved them into his house starting tonight to care for them and um so I don't know if God's giving Seth a, a bigger pay raise so they can buy a bigger house to take care of this, but he has decided to be the carekeeper of his father-in-law, which is more than honorable. And the mom just broke down and cried. And she said, I can't believe you're doing this. She said, I have no way out. I can't believe. And they moved in last night to be with them. And it's going to be different till they can kind of get things worked out, but we need to pray for them too been a whirlwind this week so let's go from there amen Did, would anybody like to pray for these prayer requests would anybody like to just lift them up yes okay please pray so we can hear you father god we just thank you for this time together this evening lord and we thank you that your word says we can come boldly to your throne room full of mercy and grace, Lord. So we lift up these requests, Lord. Specifically, Lord, we just thank you for Danny, Lord. We just know that your healing is hurt. Lord God, comfort him, Lord God. And when he turns in all the um, the information that the doctor will say, they found nothing, Lord. Amen. We thank you yeah. that you're the healer of hearts, minds, souls, spirits, Lord. God, we just thank you for precious Julie. Lord God, we believe that she's being healed in the name of Jesus. Lord, Amen. we just cast out any fear in her, Lord. Just make her full of faith. Lord, let her be surrounded by men and women that will just cover her in prayer and encourage Amen. her, Father God. Amen. And Lord, we know that it doesn't matter if it's a headache or cancer. It's just as easy either way for you to heal it, Lord. Yes, and Lord God, we just thank you for Seth and Kara. Lord, I just thank you for their precious spirits. Lord God, and the way they're taking on this, this huge endeavor, Lord God, and only by you can they do this, Lord. So we just ask that that love that they have and that hope and that strength will just go throughout that household. Lord, we pray that Freddie will be healed in the name of Jesus, Lord. It's not too late that you can't heal him now, Lord God. And we just thank you for the favor over Seth, Lord God, and help him in his decision, Lord, of what he wants to do about this job guide him lord and don't let him think that anything's too hard for you god if this is the right yes. time for him to take that position for him to have the peace of god that passes all understanding Amen. and lord Amen. just give care a peace lord let there just be overwhelming peace and unity in that household lord Amen. god and lord we thank you for nathan lord we thank you for that ability you've given him to come in Lord, and he's he's such a good litigator and lawyer, and he sees everything. Give him eagle eyes. Give his whole team the eagle eyes to see this case, Lord, to present it uh, in a matter where it will be won in yes, their Lord. favor, God, because, Lord, we know that his footsteps are ordered by the Lord, and, Lord, we know that you give favor to people in every place they go, Lord God. We just thank you, Pastor Rick, Judy, Lord, I thank you for all these precious people on this call bless us and let us take this lesson and apply it to our life amen i love you all i hope this minister do tonight i i don't feel as confident maybe as you got received but i pray it touched you and, and blessed you in the name of the lord i love you we'll go next week need anything give me a call yeah brian what okay Shalom to one and all. Good to see you. Good night.